there's a reductionist belief around things like food that you know, and, and other sort of sacred kind of activities that make us human that we've managed to kind of boil down to an essential thing the way we do everything in our lives as humans, right? We, we want to become more efficient at it, we want more productive. And um, I believe there's, there's about five things that we, we are as humans, that we do as humans, that really just don't, don't deserve that kind of treatment. And, uh, you know, breathing, sleeping, um, procreating, uh, eliminating, and, you know, eating uh, are, are essential things that just don't, don't, don't belong in that category. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Jeffrey and Satya, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, so I was introduced to both of you by way of Clay, and he introduced us separately, not mentioning to me that you are both husband and wife. And, you know, Sajja, you work on making hats, and Jeffrey, you're known as a chef and restaurateur. I'd, I'd imagine that I was going inter- to interview both of you separately, so this will be a really interesting conversation. Uh, but, you know, where I want to start, uh, Jeffrey, is, is if, with you. Uh, I, I read something in your bio, which I almost never do a ton of research on people that I interview by design, but this kind of struck me. It said that at the age of eight, um, you tried to recreate what you had seen on TV in your family's kitchen, uh, and your mother played a big role in that. So I'm curious uh, about sort of that moment that happened for you, as well as the relationship with your mother and the impact that it's had on your life and the work that you've ended up doing. <laughs> wow, you just went there. That's a good question. Um, so <laughs> Don't worry, you'll get used to it. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, the, so I was eight, and um, my brother and I were kind of latchkey kids. Um, and my brother was older than I was by about two and a half years. And uh, being latchkey kids, if you know what that means, it was late 70s, you know, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, parents were divorced. We grew up in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Uh, mom was busy building her own business, and my dad had his own consultancy. And so every couple of days, we were, um, or most days after school, we were, we were home alone or with our friends, but we kind of, you know, had our own keys and came in and out of the house and, you know, made our own entertainment. And um, uh, we'd get hungry around like five o'clock and my mom was commuting back from the city and some nights, you know, it wasn't with my dad. So we'd get hungry and um, my brother had no instincts at all for cooking or working really with his hands. He could burn water basically. And so um, (laughs) as the story goes, he's become a much better cook now. Um, But at the time I had a real interest for some reason and somewhere between like 3.30 in the afternoon and six o'clock at night on PBS local channel 13 and 21, um, were these great cooking shows. And I watched them as if I was like, you know, um, stay home mom watching soap operas. I would like, you couldn't draw me away from the television every day of the week. In fact, um, recently I had the, the good fortune of meeting, uh, the gentleman who produced all of those shows back 30 plus years ago. Um, and he and I are collaborating on a project, but the, the, those shows were so meaningful to me, and I watched them, and I just wanted to replicate them. I got hungry watching them. I uh, was, you know, Julia Child, Martin Yan, Yan Can Cook, uh, Great Chefs, Great Cities, um, you name it. It was, it was a really amazing set of shows. And um, because we were latchkey kids, my brother and I would go out to the store and just buy stuff. I just like, we need these ingredients. Let's go get them. And my brother being older, he'd be like, okay. And he'd take us out and make sure we had enough money, and then we'd go buy these ingredients. And then we'd come home and I'd cook and sometimes it was a complete success and sometimes it was, you know, burn the bottom of the pot and complete disaster. And, um, but every time my mom was super supportive, no matter what happened, uh, no matter what it was, uh, she was incredibly supportive. In fact, for one day we surprised her for her 40th birthday and I made a chocolate cake, uh, from like a package and, uh, it was lopsided. It was like one side was much higher than the other mm-hmm. side. And she came home and she was just like, just thrilled and happy and, you know, like, like super supportive. Didn't even point out the fact that it was lopsided or anything like that. I was just happy that, that we, that I, you know, made this cake. Um, and then fast forward, you know, my dad was pretty influential too. Um, he was a good cook, uh, and he taught me some basic things that I hadn't really learned from television. And then, you know, fast forward to graduating college and I said I wanted to pursue cooking and I did that for two years or so before, um, 
actually going to cooking school, and my mom was there every step of the way. I remember um, I was, made, was working in a restaurant in North Carolina, making like maybe seven dollars an hour if I was lucky. And um, I remember my clutch on my car broke, you know, just burned out, and I called her. I couldn't even move it from work, work to get home. And I called my mom, and she just said, "Like, oh, I'll fix it for you. Like, I'll get a fix for you. Here's my credit card." And so I had a, you know, like that kind of thing. And then later on, when I went to culinary school, she guaranteed all my student loans and was just there for me and took me to the interview process and, you know, eternally grateful to all of her support, unbiding, unquestioning support in my pursuing my passion. Mm. Sacha, I'm curious for you, uh, what sort of moment early on in your life was sort of the spark that kind of lit, you know, uh, the fuse for the career that you ended up having in, in fashion and design and the stuff that you're doing? Yeah, so my spark for fashion, and um, I grew up in a very creative family, but I was a super athlete and um, didn't get into the creative groove until after I graduated college and um, got to kind of experiment a little bit with classes. You know, I, I was sitting at a day job, at a, you know, at my desk and called my mom one evening saying, you know, I feel so much anxiety. And, you know, I was a college athlete and um, had been very competitive in high school. And she was like, well, I think you just have a lot of um, unused energy. It would be really good for you to start taking some classes and start using that energy in creative ways. And so I started off by taking, um, you know, knitting, sewing, crocheting, letter pressing, and um, I was fortunate enough to meet Jeffrey um, right after college, and he had always worn hats. And so... Um, one of the classes that I took was hat making, and it wasn't the hats that I make now, but um, I really, I, en I enjoyed it. I never thought, it wasn't one of those, like, you know, hit you over the head moments where you're like, I'm going to be a hat maker, and this is going to be my way of life. It was um, not until a couple weeks later after um, taking this class that, um, and, and, and you have to know that, like, I was working my day job and then running in the evening to FIT um, and other schools to take these, you know, after um, after work activities and creative classes, um, but a couple of weeks after my, this this millinery class, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer, and that really kind of started um, a lot of things. Actually, you know, six months before that, my parents had just gotten divorced, and my mom is diagnosed with breast cancer, and it really put into perspective. You know, do what you love and do it now because you don't know how much time you have. And so, I just started by making my mom some hats. Um, as she was going through chemo and radiation and, um, you know, then started with hats for friends and family and, you know, I was working out of our fourth floor walk at the East Village apartment. Um, you know, I hired, this is a great story actually, Jeffrey was opening a restaurant, Witchcraft in San Francisco, and he was gone for a couple of weeks at that point and I had come home and my mom had given me the whole speech of like, stop doing anything that doesn't make you happy and pursue the things that do. So I, you know, and, and we're sitting there and she's like, well, what makes you happy? And I squeaked out hats and it was kind of a surprise and shock to me. But my mom was like, go, go do that and do it, you know, in such a way that just totally fulfills you. You don't need to make money. Just do what makes you happy. And so I came back to New York, moved all of our furniture from the living room to another bedroom. Jeffrey had no idea. Hired two random people off of Craigslist who could hand sew and started making hats out of pots and pans and you know, a steam iron that I bought. And um, when Jeffrey came home, he found that I had turned our living room, you know, New York City apartment into a mini hat factory. <laughs> and so, um, you know, and, and I would have to say that I was probably, I was always entrepreneurial. I was also always a hustler. I think that being an athlete, you are constantly striving to do better and be better. And, you know, I was um, a striker. I was the one that scored the goals. So I, um, I think I always had that competitive love winning um, mentality that I think is really kind of awesome for entrepreneurs. Hmm. All right. I will come back to this. So Jeffrey, I want to ask you a question. Uh, you know, to get so absorbed in something as an eight year old, so much so that you're like, I want to recreate what I see on TV. That doesn't seem normal to me hmm. um, in any way. Like, I, I just don't, you know, that doesn't seem like the average person's childhood. Uh, I'm curious, you know, are, are there certain things that you think are just inherently part of your personality that enabled that? Like, is there sort of an obsession or a drive that like, you know, does, and has that carried into other aspects of your life? And if so, how, uh, and, and you know, what, what is sort of the important lessons for somebody who's listening to take away from that? Uh, knowing yeah. that parents are listening to this. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I'd say at that time it was, 
probably a combination of, at least as I can remember, it was a combination of just being hungry. <laughs> <laughs> like literally, like um, I liked making things with my hands. So I like doing puzzles. I like putting things together. So I like constructing things. And so um, cooking didn't seem like a, it, it seemed very much sort of in that vein where we were, you know, building something uh, and you worked in your hands and it was very exciting and it was, you know, and then you could eat it. Um, I also think that inherently, for some reason, whether it's an early age or, or somewhere in that progression, um, I just enjoyed what things tasted like. And I, I don't know if that's you know a natural predisposition, um, sense of smell, sense of taste were very like attenuated when I was a kid, um, and I just loved that. I didn't, and there's very few things that I rejected eating. Um, I had a preference for steak, but like I ate every day, ate sushi and chicken, at a, you know, and, and, and greens at a very young age. And I remember loving garlic and butter and like those things at a young age, really, really uh, a lot. And so um, I think that maybe that may have been the only sort of predisposition, which is I just had a, a penchant for the way things tasted. Um, and that led me to sort of following that. And then, then there became this like reinforcing mechanism, learning how to cook at a young age when I was in high school and in college was very useful, both like it was a social thing. It was different. It was, you know, it was attractive. It was like another quality or characteristic that people were like, ooh and ah about. And then later on, it also paid my way through college. So I was able to kind of, you know, I didn't have, we didn't have a lot of money. It was a way of diffusing a lot of the burden by working. And so I worked my way through college, a bunch of odd jobs the first two years. And then the last two years, I just worked my, my tail off in restaurants. And, um, and so then it became a reinforcing mechanism. It wasn't just about food or about the pleasure. It was like, oh, doing this provides me with a way of life. And then, then that turned into an appreciation of the finer elements of cooking, the finer elements of taste, the finer elements of hospitality and service, which then, then I was in a whole different world. You know, you're not, not only is there a predisposition to that, um, you know, making people happy, but it's something you learn, but, but it definitely, that was the pathway. So you mentioned the idea of a reinforcing mechanism. Uh, I'm curious, you know, if a parent is listening to this, what would you say to them about finding those reinforcing mechanisms in their own ch children's lives, having had the experience you have? I mean, I'd say the, you know, like I said earlier about my my mom and, and actually my, my brother too and my dad, they all, you know, no one at any point sort of told me no. Uh, they encouraged me and supported me in all different kinds of ways. You know, between my mom and all the support we described, my brother and being like a partner in crime on cooking and like figuring out how to get ingredients and such. And later on, he gave me a book that that um, compelled me to actually go to culinary school and, and take it as a as a as a career. He was the first person who said this could be a career for you. Um, and so, and then my dad um, sort of putting a lot of different food and recipes in front of me. So I think uh, you know, if I think of those three people as sort of early parents in my life, you know, both parents and brother, um, they just encouraged, they didn't, they didn't disabuse me of any dreams or any, any, um, hopes and desires that I had. And I think, uh, that allowed me to pursue it and they gave me positive reinforcement. They were like, Oh, this is, the, this is amazing. This is delicious. They support, like it was all just love and support. Um, and that wasn't always the case in every other aspect of our lives, but in this case it was very much so. And so I think that's an important, um, you know, important lesson. Interesting. Uh, you know, I, I had a high school band director in ninth grade uh, who, you know, I have no like genetic predisposition for musical talent, but for some reason he had, he was a, a positive reinforcement mechanism in the same way enough that I ended up getting into a school of music. I never pursued it, but um, I, you know, to this day, like a lot of the things that he taught me uh, have, have shaped kind of my discipline and habits. Uh, Sacha, this is a question for you. Uh, By the way, we have a sorry. phrase. We, our, we train our dogs, and we're we're wrestling with this because they're you know they they do the things they want to do. But there's a phrase. It's called "sit happens." Uh -huh. So you know when sit happens, you have to reward it. <laughs> yeah. So Sacha, this is a question for you. You know, you mentioned um, you know a parent parents getting divorced, mother getting breast cancer, uh, and then sort of you know being sort of awoken to this idea that hey, you know this could all be over at any moment. And this is a consistent pattern that I've seen in people that I've interviewed is there is always some sort of wake up call that actually gets them to do what they end up doing. And I, I keep wondering whether that is absolutely necessary to actually stop seeing those things that we hear, uh, or, you know, stop seeing those things as cliches and start to live them. So I'm curious what you have to say about that, having experienced it. 
Yeah, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm kind of very fortunate. I have very cool parents who've always told me. I mean, my dad had, you know, ten commandments, and one of those was do what you love to do, and money will follow you. Um, so, you know, I think that in retrospect, it seemed like a bigger call to action when I probably have had thousands, maybe millions of different small um, situations like that. Maybe not death of my a parent, but um, lots of situations, and I think that. In retrospect, it's just an easy way to call out a very particular call to action. Um, but I, but I would, I would challenge the fact that I probably had many calls to action throughout my entire life. It's just that this seemed mo- the most momentous. Um, you know, it, it's it's like hindsight's you know twenty twenty. It's you know I, I probably have had many different calls, and that was just one that makes obviously a really interesting story, but also, you know, everybody is faced with challenges and situations. It's just, are you going to be that person who actually stands up and says, I'm willing to be brave enough to say yes. Mm. All right. So I want to ask you something that was in my mind when I knew I was going to be talking to both you guys together. Um, how did you guys meet and what role did food play in all of that? Um, do you want me to take this? Go for it. All right. So um, I had just graduated college, moved to New York City, signed a six-month lease, um, was very sure that I was going to move back to California after these six months, took an intern- a paid internship at Bryant Park, um, you know, one of those like schlepping jobs where you're up at like four o'clock in the morning watching people move in. The, the Bryant Park is pretty active during the summer. And, um, and this is my side of the story. There's a couple of pieces that I didn't know. So Jeffrey will tell, will tell <laughs> that their side of it. But, um, one day this incredibly handsome man walks into the office that I'm working in and I felt like I was kicked in the stomach. I just knew I needed to meet him. So, um, he was taking a meeting in the center um, of the office in a glass conference room And I had called the guy that I was sort of seeing, you know, the New York dating situation where he was probably seeing like 50 other people. And I was like very much just seeing him and (laughs) called him, told him I couldn't meet him for lunch, that I had to work and literally walked across the conference room, you know, uh, past the glass so I could see Jeffrey's face. He made eye contact. So I knew that was a good thing. Went to my boss's office, dropped something off, then walked back, noticed that he made eye contact again and um, waited for him to get out of the meeting. And once he did, I jumped out of my office, ran up to him, and just introduced myself, um, in which Jeffrey, who's very verbose, said, how do you like working here? Um, Very quickly. And, you know, I I said I liked working there. He left. We only exchanged those words. Um, But he was smart enough to remember my name and uh, found an email that I had emailed. You know, every week I would email 50 people all you know, BCC'd. Um, but luckily enough, my email address was like satya at urbanmanagement.com or brianpark.com. And um, he emailed me saying, um, you know, it was great to put a face with a name. Would it be presumptuous to ask you out for a drink? In which I responded, only if you can spell presumptuous correctly. <laughs> and we've been in together ever since. And actually, um, before he emailed me, I called my mom when I was getting food um, cause at that point I was practically starving and told her that I met the man I was going to marry. And she asked me, what's his name? What does he do? Who is he? And I told her his name is Jeffrey. I don't know anything. No, I, I have no other information. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeffrey, I want to hear it from your side. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think we've been telling this story now for 11 years, so it's, it's <laughs> a pretty good version of it. The two things that are missing or that, that only I would know is a couple weeks prior to that, uh, Satya, I was in one of the operations, one of the kiosks that we were operating in, in the park, um, and I was checking in on the kiosk, maybe training some staff. And uh, I guess the new hires for Bryant Park had got, were getting a tour around the park. And I remember uh, the group kind of walking through and then just, you know, being introduced, and I kind of waved uh, to everyone. And I remember there was someone in that group that was just knockout gorgeous and like I was like I couldn't like I remember just thinking about her for a long time and and uh, <laughs> but like and then, but then, then you know a couple weeks passed um maybe it was about six weeks past yeah. or so and then um and then when we first met in that that day in the office uh you know literally I am not speechless as your listeners will will, will be able to test after this podcast <laughs> um and uh all I could come up with was like, Oh, how do you like working here? You know, it was like this goofy voice. And, um, 
And Sati was just like, uh, she took, she kind of took the reins at that moment. She's like, hi, I'm Sati. And she's just, you know, just said good. And, and sort of gave me a sense of like, oh, wow, this is something I want to pursue. So then I got back to my office and I like, you know, did the best search I could for Satya in the email. And then I, I got, I got her email address. And then, you know, being the coy New York bachelor that I was, I, I invited her for drinks as opposed to mm-hmm. dinner because, you know, I didn't know if I was going to, we were going to hit it off. And sure enough, within like a half an hour, um, we were hitting it off. Now I went to the bar that we were going to meet at the restaurant at the bar that we were going to meet at about a half hour early to get the right like seat and kind of get the whole situation, you know, dialed in. And I had probably one too many cocktails mm-hmm. beforehand. That was like two gin and tonics opposed to one. And, uh, and this woman walks in who I know from years ago, like never dated her, just a friend of, of my brother's, but, um, she's like tall and gorgeous. And, and as I'm saying hi to her and giving her a big hug, like Satya walks in and I was just like, uh Oh, and then the date went really, really well. Um, yeah. This woman was like a supermodel. It wasn't even like just a good looking woman. It was like <laughs> supermodel. And of course, you know, I, I'm nine years younger than Jeffrey. And so there was a moment of, Oh shit. Like, <laughs> You know, he dates supermodels, and I'm just, you know, little old me. Yeah, you were gorgeous, <laughs> gorgeous as it was. Um, and then um, the how food plays a part. I mean, really, um, I'd say food in for the our meeting didn't really play a part, other than then that was my career, and we were fortunate that uh, my career landed me in Bryant Park during that time, and you know, Sati was there. Um, I'd say very much in our career, in our in our in our relationship my career has sort of been connected to you through your mom as an amazing cook, a cookbook yeah. author has used food and um, cooking as a way to connect to family and community um, all the time. And then, um, and then I'd also just say you, you like our, I've introduced us to a lot of foods and things that you wouldn't, that you didn't grow up eating. And it's always been like this great experimentation. It's been this wonderful sort of relationship, part of our relationship. So, yeah, and I would say that even uh, in the opposite direction, you know, even though Jeffrey is the foodie, I think that whether it's me or my family, um, I think Jeffrey's really opened up to cooking a lot more with vegetables and yeah. <laughs> um, experimenting more with less meats, more, you know, greens and lentils and, you know, legumes. And, um, you know, you know, we've been together 11 years and the – metamorphosis in which Jeffrey's cooking and the type of food that he cooks has also incredibly changed all delicious in all different phases um, but it's 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 interesting to watch as our relationship has progressed what type of foods we as a couple have gravitated towards and how that's changed over time wow. so I don't know about you but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing but as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Yeah, Jeffrey, you said something uh, about food being this tool for connection and community, and nobody's ever talked about food like that to me before. Um, I'd like to talk about that in a lot more detail because that sounds so fascinating to me. I, I'd never even thought about looking at food that way. Um, can you explain more what you mean by that? And more importantly, how do we create in our lives and how can we leverage food as this uh, mechanism for connection and community? Uh, this is a, like a long subject and probably the next chapter of my life's work uh, <laughs> uh seriously um so it's it's um i'll do it i'll try to do it as as you know quickly as i can or as, as succinctly um but it, it it does deserve a much larger conversation because that that inherently is the problem uh there's a reductionist um 
just to take it at a high level, so there's a reductionist belief around things like food that you know, and, and other sort of sacred kind of activities that make us human that we've managed to kind of boil down to an essential thing the way we do everything in our lives as humans, right? We, we want to become more efficient at it, we want more productive. And um, I believe there's, there's about five things that we, we are as humans, that we do as humans, that really just don't, don't deserve that kind of treatment. And, uh, you know, breathing, sleeping, um, procreating, uh, eliminating, and, you know, eating uh, are, are essential things that just don't, don't, don't belong in that category, you know. Um, and if you look at all the research on, on a lot of those things, uh, we should be taking more time with, we should be sleeping more than, than, than what, we, what we are, you know, and why it's necessary. We should be uh, breathing more, right, uh, better. Um, we should be, you know, taking serious care of our sex lives and our, our you know, the way we, we, we eliminate. And uh, we don't. And so, and food, um, for me, is just the lens through which I look at that conversation, right? Because I know it well. I've seen it firsthand. And I understand all that I could possibly understand in 20 plus years of being in, in professionally in food and, you know, let's call it almost, you know, 30 plus years of being a, a great appreciator of food. Um, and I'd say that if you take food and you think of it only as a subset of uh, what I consider to be a much larger grouping called nourishment, uh, and I'm not just talking nutrition, but nourishment, um, that's where you get into what is nourishment and what is, um, you know, what what does that really mean and how does it um, play a part in our lives that we're not even aware of. And so um, we're nourished when we sit down at the table with friends. We're nourished with the memories that we, that we um, uh, you know, create in those moments. We're nourished by knowing where our food was came from. We're nourished by knowing who actually picked it, um, how an animal was killed, how vegetables were, were picked, you know, who, who, what's the name of the farmer, what's the name of the person who worked on that farm. Um, better yet, we're even more nourished if you think about it. If you look at any of the uh, media that you know, talks about where things are grown, our obsession with growing things, obsession with growing things indoors and in urban environments, all of that to me under the, is under the auspice of being more productive uh, and it's it's looking in the wrong way. I think it, it comes from an obsession of, of of wanting connection, um, and we are defined. I mean, there's a whole other sequence to this, but um, com- you know, countries were built through the word campania, uh, which really was you know loose affiliations of people before they were known as countries, and campania meant to share bread. And so the first countries, and then eventually the first companies. Uh, really get its origin from from the people you shared bread with. So it goes back as far as, as long as time is you know, uh, around that um, we didn't eat just to eat. We eat, we ate, and it represented something of our connection to our, to other humans and community. There's a uh, study that came out around type 2 diabetes and, and ancestral links to that and sort of uh, and then how, how the human species evolved. And one of the most amazing things is uh, communities developed around places where uh, calories were most dense, uh, like shellfish beds on coastal areas, uh, predominantly because um, you know that's where um, people figured out that they needed to connect in order to save that resource. And so food is, is as vital as that. And anyone who tells you that there's a silver bullet, uh, that they have a silver bullet of food that's going to you know, cure them of something or make them better, or that food should be in a package or should be easily accessible, um, to me is, is really doing an injustice to what it means to be, to be human. Wow. Uh, so two things come to mind. You must despise something like Soylent or whatever that stuff is. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> No, not at all. So I've, <laughs> I've had a I've had a huge 180 on Soylent. Okay. And, and from my original, uh, I call it um, prejudiced mind, and then I sort of took a beginner's mind, humble approach to it, uh, and actually asked them the questions about what you know. Speak. I've met with founders and sort of asked them what was what was up. And if you think about it, um, yes, I don't like it in its uh, writ large in what it, its implications can mean for 
the future of food. Yeah. But when you think about um, the billion plus people who are food insecure around the world, sure, yeah. um, the potential for providing uh, essential nutrients in a relatively delicious but um, but but um, consumable and absorbable uh, package, it's you know it's infinitely better than dropping rice out of an airplane mm -hmm. uh, and la hoping it lands in the right place. Um, it's, it's really, you know, if, it, if, I, if I don't think Silicon Valley should be drinking it because that's just silly, but I think that, like, uh, there's, no, there's no need for that, but I think uh, its ability to provide essential resources to the people who are most in need, who we don't, haven't yet spent the time or money or invested those resources into solving agricultural problems in these places, or sometimes are up against you know bigger problems. Um, I think we it's it can be a useful tool as long as it doesn't become the norm, but it, it is used to solve the longer term problem, which is create food security so that people can start to focus on building uh, sustainable agricultural pra pra practices in, in communities they need most. You know, I, the other thought that came to my mind while you were just kind of describing the entire concept of food and community, uh, you know, I, I did a study abroad in Brazil uh, when I was in graduate school. And I remember I would sit with a friend. We would sit at this cafe on the side of the street in Sao Paulo, and we would start our dinner at 7, and the dinner wouldn't end till like 11 o'clock. Even after we'd eaten, we'd just sit there. And you would see all these people there. And they would be there the whole time. And I'm kind of like, wow. You know, and it's like the idea of sitting down in a restaurant for four hours, that's just unheard of. Like, I've never done that with a friend here. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's a whole other conversation about <laughs> cultures eat across the world. But it, you know, I think that's, it's not just about the food on the plate. And, you know, we're obsessed now, it is, with what happened, like, the creativity, going back to creativity, right now, the creativity for the most part, except for a couple pockets, is limited to the perimeter, the diameter of a plate, and it shouldn't be. Uh, and you know, people are so obsessed with food as medicine, and I sort of, while it has the ability to heal, you know, certain foods have the ability to heal. I believe that the, the meal is the medicine. And that's really what heals is the time spent with others. So, so I have a question. Um, you know, you both have these different art forms that you're deeply immersed in, and I'm curious how your expertise in each of your art forms has influenced each other's work uh, in your own art forms, if that makes any sense. Like, basically, Satya, how does the design background uh, influence Jeffrey's cooking and uh, background? And Jeffrey, how is your background in doing what you do as a chef uh, and restaurateur uh, influenced what uh, Satya does designing hats? You want to take that? Um. Yeah. Um, does it make sense? For a second. So how, how does my expertise as like a hat maker, factory yeah, owner exactly. influence? Yeah, um, exactly. It's an interesting question. You know, I don't know if it's specifically our expertise. I would I would. Or just the background. It may be like our experiences and what we're doing and the people that we interact with and those type of, type of experiences in which maybe those influence most our relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I would say, especially since Jeffrey, you know, I always, you know, I've had the fortunate, um, I've had the good fortune of having such an amazing, incredible, smart, sexy husband um, who, you know, now has come and has been helping me in my business, um, but now really getting to see the ways that he specifically thinks through problems. Um, I would say that Jeffrey and I are kind of on maybe not too far of a spectrum of how we think about problems and solutions, but Jeffrey really thinks of things very um, uh, uh, systematically. And so having him come and work in my business has really shown me how incredibly intelligent and smart he is in the way that he thinks about things. Um, and I would say that, you know, I don't know if that's come from just who he is naturally or if it's come from being a chef and having to think systematically through, you know, how much, how much food to buy, how much, um, how much food to prepare for an evening, you know, how much rice does he need in order to make a dish and those types of things. But, um, the way that Jeffrey thinks systematically is pretty incredible. I would, I would challenge anybody who thinks more, um, logically than my cute man here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would answer, uh, sir, from two sides. So, um, being exposed to Satya's world, uh, friends, uh, influences, especially being in the business for the last six months, uh, working day to day, 
uh, as well as uh, her creative process and like understanding uh, the, the way in which she makes decisions has opened me up to um, being a little more liberal, a little more loose with my decision making process around things, around design, around what what my next work will be and, and how that'll look. Like being a lot more impulsive in a good way, like want, like going with a feeling as opposed to you know putting that through a big editor before it, it, it comes out as a as a finished a perfectly finished product and. Um, Really, yeah, I'm, in, I'm intuitively impetuous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, brilliantly so, and so um, the uh, so that's one that's one way. And then on the flip side, I think I look at you know we at this hat factory. You know, it's it's five thousand square feet. It's um, got materials. It's got equipment. It has there are recipes technically on like how to make each hat um, when you're doing it at scale. You know, there's the prototype, and then there's there's the bulk, right? And so uh, I look at it a little bit like a kitchen back there, or at least applying those same skills. And in a kitchen, you need to have inventory. Um, you need to have you know the right amount of materials. You need to have a recipe. You need to understand what proportion you need in each in each item. And then you need a set of instructions, and, and you need uh, a really clear you know process on how to produce uh, the actual item. And then you need quality check in the kitchen. Those things are you know you taste everything. You sort of you, you give us a recipe and a step of a step of service, and then you taste everything and make sure it goes out the door. And there's a second set of eyes on it, and checks the plate, and so there's there's all those things. So I think the same same principles and same tools apply to manufacturing, and probably if you think about it, to software development and to uh, any business. In fact, you know, short little plug here, but I'll be working and writing a book on on this very subject, which is what are the lessons from from the restaurant world that can be applied to business, to productivity, to, you know, your own life. Because mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of really good stuff in the kitchen. If you think about it, to feed 300 people a night in a three-star New York City kitchen uh, with hopefully flawlessly most nights with a team of people who are basically unskilled other than in cooking, um, it's quite an accomplishment. So uh, the skills and tools that we use in the kitchen, the best kitchens actually, uh, are super useful outside of the kitchen. Interesting. You know, when I, when I hear you describe that, it feels almost as if, you know, the way you would prepare a dish is kind of the way I went through the book writing process, you know, like all the ingredients that I need to make this thing come together, somebody constantly giving me feedback. It, it, you know, it, what was interesting to hear you describe, it sounds like a creative process that could be applied to just about anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think I've learned from Satya to open up the creative process a little bit, allow some more time up front for uh, play and experimentation and exploration. Uh, and then, and then kind of put it through the funnel and edit it down. Okay, so I, I want to ask you a question that came from my business partner, Brian. I mean, with, with both of you being so immersed in each other's worlds uh, professionally, how do you turn off the business aspect of all of this when you're just trying to be together personally, or do you? And, and how does that work? You know, it's, it's definitely not come without challenges in the beginning. I think now we've got it down, um, especially when we started working with each other. Um, you know, we'll be like, for example, yesterday we'll be on a plane and, you know, or coming home, let's say from work one night and we'll both be working in the same office and just shutting off and saying, okay, we're not going to talk about work has been really important. We've kind of set the parameters of, um, almost like scheduling appointments. If there are things that we need to discuss that need to happen today and we didn't have time to get to them during the day, we set kind of time with each other and we say, hey, do you have time tonight to speak You know, for 15 minutes or 30 minutes about this thing or that thing or this project? And we kind of, you know, kind of deal with it that way. But I think for the most part nowadays, we're just like so excited to be out of the office with, you know, with each other, not having to do work stuff that, you know, it's, it's not, it's no longer a challenge not to talk about work, but to be present with each other and just, you know, have fun, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, we went through a little bit of a rough patch when we first started, um, mostly around uh, kind of disagreements on the way in which, you know, processes and the way we were going to uh, set goals and, and the way we were going to, um, both of us were digging into the business, like the, the degree of commitment that maybe Satya felt I was giving or not giving, um, you know, she didn't feel that necessarily I was, I was as committed. And, and on the flip side, I felt like I was very committed. Uh, and that was, you know, kind of a bit of arrogance on my part because there was so much I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't bring a beginner's mind to the business. And so, um, I think there's a uh, a bit of arrogance on my part to like sit there and say, okay, well, I know everything about this because it's just like running running restaurants, and and 
that's not true. And so, um, so I'd say like if, if there's any piece of advice for couples out there, um, and in particular, this, this isn't limited to people who work together. This is actually limited to, this is expanded to, you know, I'd say men and women or, or, or couples t- together who, who are entrepreneurial and work their, their, their tails off and then sort of ask each other for even for advice about their own businesses and such like that is, uh, one is I'd say like make time for, for, for love and for, you know, the relationship, right? Like it's not all about, it's just not all about, about work. Like that's just silly. Uh, nothing is that important. Right. Um, I think the other thing is just be, be willing, uh, when the other person is, is explaining themselves to you and, or, or expressing themselves or, um, asking you to do something, just be willing. Don't take positions, just be willing, kind of approach it with a humility and a, a beginner's mind, so to speak. I keep using that phrase, but it's so important that you, you know, go to it with a very open mind. And, like there's nothing there. There's nothing in there. Just like, let me listen to the, to what's happening right now. And I think just the other thing is just figure out what that person needs and support them. Like it's not about, you know, I think men have a tendency to mansplain when it comes to business. And like, it's not, <laughs> about, it's not about that. And like, you know, it, it, it's just not about, it's not about you. It's totally not. And so, um, taking the approach of saying, okay, I can help, but like, you know, being more like Yoda than, you know, some sort of, you know, expert, you know, Yoda is just, you know, calm and an expert, right. <laughs> but he doesn't, but he doesn't show off and like, you know, and I think it's, uh, he has good questions. So, um, I think that's, I would say that's the key. Those are some of the keys. All right. Let's shift gears a little bit. Um, I have some specific questions that are asking for my own personal morbid curiosity. So I'm a disaster in the kitchen because I have an Indian mother. And whenever I ask her for instructions on how to cook, the instructions are just put in a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I'm like, what the hell? Uh, Because Indian moms don't use recipes. Like there literally are no recipes at our house anyway. Uh, So I I guess, you know, the the question I'm asking is, you know, if I were to, you know, want to delve down this path to get, you know, from a level of just complete incompetence and being somebody who's probably likely to set the kitchen on fire to a person who can actually navigate uh, a kitchen, what would you tell me to do? I would say check out Tim Ferriss's four I figured hours. you'd say that. <laughs> um, you know, Jeffrey contributed it to it. But it also, I think, is we, we gift it to friends who are interested in cooking because I think, you know, we've known Tim before he was, you know, a four-hour chef and... Um, the guy would, you know, couldn't boil water. And I think that, you know, through the process of just even, um, reading and creating what he has for this book, I think he's really done some really cool and different things with how to cook. Um, yeah, yeah, Jeffrey can probably talk more about that specifically. Well, I think that it is a great resource, uh, you know, objectively it's a great resource. Uh, it's probably one of the best out there. It's thick. And if you just stick to the even just the essentials, like the domestic um, section, and learn the techniques. Um, it'll be super helpful. I think when I when Tim and I were working together, one of the things I uh, sort of focused on, which every cook learns this early on, but not many people at home learn this, which is a real fundamental focus on uh, technique and comfortability uh, in the environment of the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas you know, so much of what it is is recipes. Look, you're 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 freaked out because your mom doesn't work with recipes. Well, that's like where we're in our, I'm in my biggest comfort zone is, is, you know, in a place where there are no recipes. In fact, I mean, I haven't looked at a recipe. I can't tell you how long it's been since I looked at a recipe, not because I'm an experienced cook, but because even the new stuff, it's sort of like, um, you really learn by learning the technique and, and actually screwing up a lot. You learn, you learn pretty well by that. So, um, so I say that that's the, um, the key is like learning, learning, you know, what you're supposed to be looking for, um, from a technique standpoint, um, and not being afraid. I mean, no, 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 hopefully, uh, when you cook, uh, no one's going to die, right? <laughs> like there's been very few ex- examples in your home kitchen where you've done something where you're going to kill somebody. So other than that, it's all fair game. And so, uh, just be, don't be afraid, right? Don't be afraid. And if you get burnt, like very few things you're going to do are going to really hurt yourself. A um, couple of key principles on knives and hot oil and, and you'll be fine. And like learn those things and, you know, and you'll be great. So I really do think that um, 
It's about playing and learning, and you'll get up the curve really, really quickly. Um, if not for our chef, um, probably the best, like I hands down the best um, online sort of resource for, for cooking is any of the videos from Jacques Pepin. He's just the best teacher out ever uh, in cooking. And uh, it's, it's like remarkable to watch him watching code so to and watch his videos okay very cool um so in the spirit of doing research for my second book uh i want to ask you guys uh, about sort of daily habits and systems and, and kind of what are your what do your days look like um well i i like not having you know too much structure in my day especially right now um i yeah right now i'm focusing on getting a lot of sleep which is really <laughs> nice um, but also not rushing. I found that I've been, you know, really rushing everything, you know, not, I don't have enough time to meditate in the morning because I'm running off to work or, and, and actually, you know, I, I, I should preface that by saying having Jeffrey work at my, um, at the factory with me, he's really opened up the opportunity for me not to rush. Um, and again, I think I've said this before, but like, he's such a man. Um, he's really taken the time and energy and love to give me what I need, knowing that right now is a time for me to kind of, you know, especially being a creative person, you can't be constantly running around and be doing everything. And um, being the creative person that I am, I was also running the factory, um, doing operations, doing payroll, doing taxes, you know, doing all the things that really kill creativity. And so since Jeffrey's come in to the factory, um, he's taken a lot off my plate as a good, you know, a uh, partner in crime would do and has allowed me the freedom to kind of say, okay, what does my creative soul need right now? And how do I feed that in a way that's going to be most beneficial to the business? Hmm. And Jeffrey, what about yeah. you? Um, my mornings are, so I, 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 I like learned that the most important thing for me is uh, not about structuring the entire day, um, but about uh, setting it off, in the right, in, in the best way possible. If I do the, a couple of things in the morning well, then I can at least most days of the week I can I can kind of trigger a state of you know we call it flow mm -hmm. uh, slash productivity slash happiness that um, that I feel you know time slows down a little bit um, things get done better uh, and I maintain a certain level of, of happiness. So you know that includes. Uh, mornings uh, up relatively early after a good night's sleep. You know, sort of. I've been practicing respecting my sleep a lot more recently. Um, so you know, at early to bed, early to rise, kind of thing. Or if it's late to bed, late, later to rise. And um, walk my dog, meditate. Uh, super important. Uh, you know, great practice. Uh, about twenty minutes in the morning, and then um, I'll typically you know prepare maybe a little breakfast for Satya. I try not to eat breakfast um, in the morning. I kind of go on a, I do a lot of like, kind of try to fast until about one o'clock. Uh, have some fat in my coffee or my tea, uh, like coconut fat or whatever. But other than that, nothing. Um, and really try to eat only in a window between toward twelve and eight in the daytime, so that uh, my body can really rest and keep immunity up and sort of focus. Um, and then, uh, you know, one of the most important things that I'll sort of talk about this in my book, but is preparing the night before for the next day. So like in, in, in the kitchen, you prepare a prep list. Uh, and uh, if you don't have a prep list from the night before, then your day is just shot. So having just an idea of what your day looks like. And then the flip side of that is I've learned, you know, if I can get, if I can get really productive and do everything I want to do and, and a lot of what I want to accomplish before one o'clock, then the afternoon is like, it's kind of open-ended. And so it's, it's available to, to chat on podcasts, you know, <laughs> with you and, and to, <laughs> To not be so um, high strung about you know what else needs to get done, so uh, I try to try to focus and land there. As you know, my sort of mental fuel kind of bounces back around seven o'clock at night. So somewhere between two or three and seven, I'm, I'm not that not that productive, not that great. So I try to do that. I also learned something from like the military, just studying the Marines. It's like for a long time they were getting people were getting killed on missions because the last two minutes of the mission were were um, uh, you know, played out like every every play was was done, and, and something would go wrong, and, and then they would end up having friendly fire, and someone would get shot. And then they made this practice, they changed this practice in the early '80s, and they uh, 
last two minutes of any mission is not scripted, and uh, fewer deaths in missions uh, would occur. And so I think uh, flip side of that is like don't over script your day, don't over script your afternoon because you know something's going to go wrong, something's going to change, and if you do, you'll find yourself in a mental battle with like feeling frustrated with the fact that the day uh, didn't go the way you wanted it to. So kind of creating some flexibility. Plus, I think it'll also allow us for the opportunity for magic to kind of yes, happen. Yes, and uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate that perspective so much because I like, I'm completely in agreement with that. You know, like I have the first probably two to three hours of my day structured where I write a thousand words every morning. But um, I've realized like right around noon, I'm like, okay, now I'm completely useless. So I should do the things that require almost no cognitive bandwidth or any creative energy. Uh, but yeah, I love the idea of at least, you know, having some small part of it that makes you feel structured and gives you some momentum. So two final questions for you guys. Um, what is one book a uh, piece of music or movie that has profoundly influenced your life that you'd recommend to our audience? Uh, a book? A book, piece, piece of music, music, or movie. Either one. Any one of those three. Uh, wow, there's a bunch uh, in each of those categories. It, top of my head, rapid fire, um, piece of music. Uh, Miles Davis' is So What is the, you know, best piece of music ever written maybe and there's a live version of it from Germany that uh, is incredible and the reason why that is so important is uh, it kind of speaks to that point about my days but it's totally structured it's incredibly thought out like it's he's one of the most creative dynamic you know artists that we've ever known uh, yet there's these moments of improvisation and uh, return and it just shows you like how smart and how how brilliant how how organized and brilliant and creative can be in their own way in their own process and every time I I have to do some deep work some deep thinking some some just you know good hour of productivity uh, I'll I'll drop that on and repeat and uh, and literally my my sort of front of my head lights up like prefrontal cortex goes like lights up lights up and I'm in like a a meditative state. It's, it's really incredible. Awesome. awesome. Okay. Um, well, he asked for a book, music, or movie. Either or, one. That, or, that works. Sacha, do you want to share better. one of yours? Yeah. Um, looks really challenging for one. I'm, I'm reading or I'm finishing right now Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert, which yeah. I would highly recommend for anybody who's interested in being in the creative sphere. Um, I think she has a really interesting perspective on creativity and how we... Um, how we deal with life and um, life and process and journey of being a creative person, and then music. I want to add that I think Hamilton um, oh, yeah. <laughs> is you know one of those things that I think the whole album Jeffrey and I listened to constantly after seeing Hamilton. I don't know five months ago. Yeah, we still sing it, and I somehow still have it in my. Every time I wake up in the middle of the night, I realize that I'm still singing Hamilton in my head. So um, I think that for me is probably one of the most influential things that I have listened to in the last couple of years. It's inspired your creativity for sure. Yeah, it, yeah. He's definitely, I mean, um, he's he's incredibly obviously talented, but it's also made me think how can, if everybody's playing this one game, how can I play a different game in the same um, competition, let's say. Mm-hmm. Wow. Forces, forces everyone to play the game. Yeah, everybody to go higher. Awesome. So I have one last question for you, which is how we finish all our interviews at the Unmistakable Creative. Uh, what do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Mm. Makes them unmistakable? Mm-hmm. You know, actually, um, I've been thinking about this a lot. and you know, I've, I've, I've had uh, the good fortune to work with some of the best people in food, uh, top of the top of the game, and then also outside my life, work with people who are just so so amazing. I mean, Tim is a great example. And um, the one thing they all have in common. Uh, and yesterday we were at, we were in L.A. in Venice, and uh, we were at Justa, which is part of the Jelena GTA Justa kind of uh, company. And the thing that they decided we got in the car, we we're leaving, and Satya said. Um, you know, I love their hand soap in the bathroom, right? Hmm. And I was like, oh, that's, you know, I've noticed that too. And and it's just this, like, old powder, you know, hand yeah. soap, right? Like, it has a great dispenser, and it's like, 
And the thing they, they do incredibly well, and I think great people do very well, is um, it's not just an attention to detail, but they're so in it. They're so in their work. Uh, they're so head down, paying attention to all those details. Not just about being obsessed about those details. It's like they don't even know any different. They're just in it. Mm. And um, they're not satisfied uh, unless every detail has been thought about. It's not just about doing those details. It's really about like the, the fun and the excitement of thinking about that. I mean, there's fun in thinking about what's the soap dispenser because it's easy to order from whatever you know janitorial supply company and install liquid hand soap dispensers that everyone else has got, but that wouldn't jive with the design or the feeling, and it wouldn't be an expression of the entire creativity of that, I mean, unbelievably now uh, successful, loved restaurant. And so I think that's just one example, but it, it's, it really is analogous for every everyone who I know in creativity who's, who's unmistakable is, is uh, they really are just so in it. Yeah, and, and I, I would have to concur with that. I think that particularly this hand soap, it's like everybody just wants to skip those fine details, those small details that they think nobody actually thinks or considers, right? And they could have done a different hand soap, like the Aesop special hand soap that every cool restaurant's using. But they've gone even further. They played a different game outside of the competition. And I, now I think about, you know, how, how do restaurants think about hand soap? Do they even care about those little details? And how much it affects me as a customer to see how those little details actually affects my experience and the way that I think they're thinking about us as consumers. Um, so, you know, I, I always say that, you know, to be remarkable, you have to be different. And to be different, you have to be, and of course, the, this term is overused, but authentic. And I don't mean authentic and like being yourself, but like really understanding what is it that you love? How is it different? Um, and I think that that makes people... Um, remarkable. Yeah, Joe. Joey Coleman says, you know, make the required the remarkable. And yeah, I think like um, it's an important message and one that's forgotten. I think that's that's definitely premeditated. I think the the best people are the ones who just like that comes naturally and instinctively, where everything just needs they're so in it mm-hmm. that everything's remarkable. Well, this has been incredible. Uh, where can people find out more about you guys? I mean, I, I would say Instagram, probably. <laughs> you know, usually people are like, our website. But I think for me, Instagram is definitely the place, which is just my, my name, Satya Twina, at Satya Twina. Yeah. Uh, for me, probably, you know, you use social media in different ways, but uh, jeffreyzorowski.com. Cool. Yeah, well, Jeffrey actually has a really funny, kind of interesting blog where he posts kind of. <laughs> it's it needs to be updated, but it, uh, it's going to be it'll be it'll be it'll be back up before this launches. So. Very cool. Well, I I really appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, join us and share your story and your insights with our listeners. This has been really fun. Our pleasure. Yeah, thank you for having both of us, and uh, I think it's your first your first one two people. So we really appreciate it. It's been fun. Yeah, absolutely, I'm just two people, a couple, a, a couple. very happy married couple. <laughs> so actually, the se- you're the second. Believe it or not. Oh, bummer. No, okay. no <laughs> Well, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that next time on The Unmistakable Creative. Our government is run by a lot of very earnest people trying to do what they think is best on both sides and trying to figure out the, the way to get the work done that they want to get done within a system that is built largely to not get anything done. Caleb Gardner joins us to talk about managing digital media and building communities for BarackObama.com.